Hey, what's up, YouTube friends? I wanted to make a video uh, of my complete inshore saltwater setup. Um, if you've been fishing for a while and your kayak set up and you know exactly what you want and what you need, maybe this video is not for you. But a lot of times when I'm fishing, I'm not the most experienced fisherman, but most of the kayak fishermen I see out like on the sound and the, and the water, at least appear like they don't have as much experience. In other words, I see them come out with kayaks and they're kind of not set up right. Maybe maybe they don't have a net or um, just rod holders to keep uh, their reels out of the salt water. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. We learn as we go. But that's what I, that's why I wanted to make this video for kind of all my newbie friends out there. Kayak fishing is a great way to experience the outdoors. It's, it's fishing that's more intimate because you're down there getting wet in the water. Um, I'm going to show you the layout on my Slayer Propel 13. If you have a Slayer, this video might be of particular interest to you because you might pick up some tips and some rigging uh, methods that you can use. But there, there's a lot of the stuff that, that you can use on any kayak. I didn't come up with all this. A lot of this I got off YouTube, just like you're watching me on YouTube. I saw other kayak fishermen that did certain things. It just worked out real cool. Um, but this, so, so if you see something you've seen before, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, present somebody else's idea as my own. I, I just want to say their idea was great. I added it to my kayak. I've, I've got this uh, set up like this, and I, pro I don't think I've made any adjustments now for about two years. This is, this is everything that I carry with me in shore. Um, nothing that I would leave behind is on the kayak. And I'm just going to start from bow to stern and show you everything. I'm going to talk about my tackle. I'm going to talk about my fishing rods. I'm going to talk about the rigging of the kayak and the thought process behind that. So uh, stay tuned. If you're interested in doing some inshore saltwater fishing, I live in the Carolinas. Um, and so a lot of the places I'm fishing are, are the, the intercoastal waterway. This is my inshore setup. Uh, so let's do it. Okay, starting here at the bow. I've got this uh, leash that I use primarily for inshore. I don't take it offshore. And, and what is it for? It's for hooking up to a dock. Sometimes we rent houses and there'll be a boat dock. So I'll hook uh, my kayak up using this. I use the bungee shock cord. I've also used this before, like towing somebody else on a kayak. Uh, if I, I've, when my kids were young, maybe less experienced, I would use that and I can unhook it. I've got two carabiners on here, a decent carabiner, um, and then this kind of cheap Walmart carabiner. As I go through this, you're going to see that I use these for different purposes. Uh, does the salt water tear them up? Yeah, it does. After about two years, uh, I throw them in the garbage. I try to spray them with DW, uh, WD-40 over over time to make them last. But eventually when the spring goes out of this, because that's what rust, this is all aluminum, but there's a spring in there that's uh, steel. I just throw them away and I go to Walmart and spend $3 and get me two new ones and replace everything. So that's my leash. It hooks up here. Sometimes if I'm standing out, like uh, if I'm standing in the water, a lot of my inshore kayak fishing is not done on the kayak. It's standing in the water to say knee deep or thigh deep and casting and just using the kayak as a base station and a means to get there but but sometimes when I'm doing that I'll use this leash and then like clip it to my shorts um, to keep the boat from floating away all right so moving on I've got this is a rubber made I think it's a 30 quart I found for okay for slayer owners this cooler fits perfectly in here you I, I and look i've got like a million coolers if i look back through here i can see one two three four coolers right now i found that this particular model of cooler is the only one that fits perfectly i fit a 24 inch drum in here i can throw them in here i like this hard cooler for inshore um, i can also put some drinks in here when i head out but you'll see i have a separate lunch cooler in the back um, this is how i rig my uh, bungees uh, when I'm driving and I've got this thing on the back of the truck, I can throw these over here. When I'm on the water, I can pull them back like this. I can pop that open and you'll probably see me do that on some of my videos, throw a fish in there and drop the bottom. To keep the fish cool, I use frozen water bottles. Uh, I, I don't think that that's any type of secret. The other thing you can do is buy, and I don't have any in here, umbrella bags. Get, or you don't buy them, get them from Walmart, like the umbrella bags, like when you walk in. You can stick your fish inside there to throw in here if you are keeping drinks in here. But that's my cooler setup. Uh, when I'm actually on the water, the rest of this leash right here, I throw it here on the left side and just get it out of the way. I just cram it down in there 
and that's where it sits while I'm paddling so that my line's not getting all tangled up in here. Right here you'll see uh, an anchor trolley. Nothing special about this except I'll say this first of all a lot of anchor trolley systems come with well nuts to put up here because this is a hard place to access on the inside of a kayak. If there's any way you can put a backing plate or washer on here, I think that's great. I had I had well nuts pull out in the ocean one time. You know, there was so much tension uh, where I was anchored off in the ocean and the waves pushing. Did it actually pull this thing out and created a little bit of mess for me? I now have a stainless steel backing plate uh, on, on the back of this uh, so that it won't pull out. Um, it was a pain to put in there because I had to like duct tape the plate onto an extension that I reached up in there and had somebody else help me and put the screws in. On my anchor trolley, you'll see that I've got my standard ring and I've got another Jeep Walmart carabiner. Believe it or not, I, I don't really even necessarily need the ring. I almost exclusively use the carabiner when I'm using my anchor, my, my sand pin and putting down through there to anchor off. If you don't know what an anchor trolley is, you know, just check out some other kayak videos. I don't have the time to talk about that right now, but you can see it runs all the way to the bow and then I can push that anchor pin back here to the stern. You'll see this system has a bungee on it, and that's really good if you're putting in the ocean or something where there's going to be waves and pulling like this. You don't necessarily need that for the sound, but, but, but I rig my boat for both. Still talking about uh, anchoring out with an anchor pin. I don't carry an anchor when I go into the sound. Most of the water I'm fishing in is, you know, maybe up to seven feet deep. You know, sometimes I'm catching fish in like two feet, feet of water. It, it just depends. A lot of your fish that are swimming in the sound, drum, trout, redfish, they're going to be in that shallow water. So here's my anchor pin. This is a homemade version. Um, I actually, there's a company that makes anchor pins and they'll sell you a replacement handle. I bought the fiberglass rods. Uh, I bought about 10 of them, sold them to my buddies who kayak fished, and then bought these handles and glued them on there. I used an angle grinder to uh, grind down my point here. This thing has lasted for years. You can see the sand has kind of scratched it up, but it's worked perfect. Um, it's really flexible. It's probably about six feet long. And you can see how I've rigged it up here. I like this system and I haven't deviated from it. I don't have a rope on my pin. So here's how I do it when I'm out on the water. One handed, I can pop that boy loose, drop that thing down, pick it up, and then put it through my carabiner here. Why my carabiner? Because if I want to unhook, if I hook a fish and then I want to go with that fish, if it's a big fish, believe it or not, I can unhook the uh, pin just like this. And, I, and then when I paddle back over, I can pop the pin back in, same way. I'm trying to do this one-handed so it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uh, difficult right now. There we go. And I gotta get this ring out of the way. And that's why I also say I've thought about ditching this ring altogether. The ring's cool, man. You can um, you can hook through it too, but you can't undo it when it's when it's hooked in there. When I'm done with my uh, sand pin, I slide it back in that piece of bungee, and I put it right back on this carabiner. And... Sorry about that. And you can see that I used a pad eye here to hold the carabiner on the front, the back side. I used bungee and ran it through because sometimes like you'll get hung up and stuff and so it doesn't just you know yank the kayak I can feel the tension like if I'm backing up and this thing gets hung in the grass but that keeps my anchor pin out of the way oftentimes I will put it on the kayak like this Oops. I'm gonna have to edit some video here while I adjust I'll, okay, so I'll keep it on the kayak just like that now that you see how it works Now all I do is pop the front. It's already through the carabiner drop the end in the sand and, we, and we're rocking and rolling and then I can anchor in whichever direction I like um, Here's my fish finder. What do I use a fish finder for mostly just to see the bottom? Okay uh, maybe in the ocean you could use it to see bait fish and things like that. But a lot of times, like you're fishing um, on the sound, you don't necessarily need a fish finder. But I like to be able to see like holes. So if it's five feet, five feet, five feet, and then there's a creek running out of uh, the grass, you know, somewhere in there is a little creek channel where it might be seven feet, eight feet. 
I want to know which side of that creek the channel's on so I can fish. And that's what my fish finder does for it. It helps me do that. This is probably nicer than what I need. The next time I buy a fish finder, it will be the cheapest model I can find because that's all I need. It's just to know depth and basically kind of see the bottom, how it lays out. I don't care about a lot of the other features. Um, moving on here. Okay, so my fish finder runs in here. The battery is inside here. I never take it out. I hooked it up to the battery and I gooped it up real nice. Um, all the connections have like uh, goop on them and tape and everything else to make them saltwater proof. And then it's all run to this cigarette lighter. Um, you would think that water would splash in there all the time and that thing would rust out. It's lasted for like three years with no problems. I did do this before I hooked it up. I put um, uh, diode grease, which is like electrical grease on my finger. And the whole inside of that thing is just coated in diode grease. Don't do it when it's hooked to the battery to burn your finger. Um, but when you hook it up, if you'll set it up that way, I don't know, but it's somehow prevented the salt water um, from getting air and messing things up. You'll notice that my fish finder, I've got this little extension on it, and it leans back just far enough so that when I lift my Propel uh, pedals, it doesn't hit the screen. And it's just a hair off to the right, so that if I get in really shallow water where I have to pull my prop up like this, I can still see my screen and still fish, right? All right, talking about this fish finder and this cigarette lighter, so I'd rub the grease in there and that keeps the salt water from messing that up. But what this is, is this rig directly to the battery. What that means is I never take that battery out. When I want to charge this, okay, I've got my charger here, my Duracell 2 amp trickle charger, which is perfect for a kayak battery. I just take this guy right here, I plug it in, and leave it there overnight. And when I come back the next morning, my fish finder is charged and I don't have to take anything apart. I don't have to take any batteries out or anything like that. You know, theoretically, another feature you could use for this is now once I'm on the water, if my phone was dead and I did want to charge it, let's say I had the charger on me, then I could plug in the charger and charge my phone back up off of my fish finder battery. So another little cool thing you can do. I didn't talk much about my scupper, um, but here's how. I have it mounted. All right, so getting down into the uh, internals of my electronics here, I've got my fish finder here. All my wiring, like I said, is uh, waterproofed as best I can and hooked to that battery, and I never take the battery out. The battery is in this aftermarket native watercraft thing that you can buy, and what it does is it actually keeps my uh, battery bag hanging right here off of these two screws. That way it's not down in the bottom of the kayak. If you've kayak fish or, or even messed around on a kayak at all, water gets in the bottom. There's water in there right now. So my battery never sits down inside that water. If you didn't have, I mean, you wouldn't have to buy this aftermarket thing, but if you didn't, I would suggest using Tupper, or Tupperware container or something to mount it up there. Right here, you can see my transducer. And let me tell you, I've had, I think, I counted up one day, I've had 18 kayaks over the years, okay? And I have mounted plenty of fish finders. That gray stuff you see right there is duct seal. Um, it is the same stuff that they, that they use, the heating and air guy uses to seal up the air ducts in your house. Anywhere where there's like the metal box and you go to the corner and you see that gray stuff. That's what that is. I've used silicone to put uh, transducers in. I've used like marine epoxies. They all eventually come loose. The crappy part about it is when they come loose, then you have to clean it off the transducer and remount it, and it'll be stuck to the transducer and hard to get off. This uh, duct seal, I can peel off a piece right in here. It's like uh, Play-Doh or something. I don't know. Um, it sticks like crazy. This thing has been mounted right there where you see it. For about six years. I put this kayak upside down on top of my truck. I ride it in the back of my truck bouncing around. I take it out in the ocean and that has never come loose. That thing is glued in there as tight as it was the first day. But at the same token, by the same token, you see, I can peel it out anytime I want to. If I took my hand down there right now and just grabbed that and started pulling, it would peel off like a heavy duty Play-Doh. Um, that is a great way to mount your transducer. It's great because it holds and does not let go. And, and then on the day that you want it to let go because you want to move your transducer or make some kind of adjustment, it comes right out. So I highly recommend using the gray duck seal 
uh, when you're mounting your tr uh, transducer. It comes in like a square block. Um, I don't think I have one sitting around, but you get it at the hardware store. Now, talking about my transducer, you can see that it's mounted about right here on the kayak. A lot of people want to mount it right here in the uh, front hole. I don't recommend that. Why? Because when you're paddling through or pedaling through the water and you're moving across the waves, what's moving up and down? Your bow, your bow is what's bouncing up and down out of the waves. So you'll see on your transducer or on your screen on your fish finder, you get all this fuzzy crap going on. Mount it somewhere central to your kayak, uh, uh, closer to the center, where you won't get all that bouncing up and down out of the water. It'll stay in the water and hopefully uh, you'll be able to see, have a little clearer picture on your fish finder. On the Propel, you know, I could consider putting it back here. I didn't want to and the reason is because I've got that prop down in the water right here, churning up whatever. Uh, so I wanted my transducer to be in front of my um, propeller, but I wanted it to be behind the bow of the boat or at least the part of the boat that bounces up and down out of the water so that I can get a nice clear reading all the time whether I'm moving or sitting still or whether the water's calm or whether there's waves coming and hitting my boat. So that's kind of the internal workings on my, uh, on my fish finder. Uh, a lot of people when you buy these fish finders, you know, they have a fuse on them uh, and that can get kind of confusing. I've never used a fuse, okay? And I think I've had three fish finders mounted on five kayaks over the years. Never had a problem with the electronics on a kayak making any type of surge or anything that ruined a fish finder. If you're going to ruin a fish finder on a kayak, you're probably going to ruin it because salt's going to get up here in the working head and ruin it. Uh, but I've never had a surge, you know, on a boat when, you've, when you're running a battery and you've got like cranking amps going on and like all this electronic stuff hooked up on a big boat, I can see why you'd have that fuse. On a kayak, I don't think you need it. So if you're rigging up your fish finder, you know, never say never. But I can tell you this, that in years and years and years of fishing, I have never had uh, some type of issue where a fuse you know, I, I needed a fuse to protect my fish finder. So uh, I'll, I'll say if you're buying a fish finder and putting it on, you know, unless it's a million dollar fish finder or something like that, if you've got $69, $89, $100, $200 fish finders, take that fuse and throw it in the garbage or you put it away in your electronics uh, tray and save it for something else. Um, I, I don't think you need them on a kayak. Now somebody will probably comment and tell a story about how their fish finder got ruined because they didn't have it. But Anyway, so there you go. That's my uh, fish finder setup and how I've got it rigged. Uh, moving on. So here are my booties. If you're fishing on the flats, I would suggest you get some. You're going to spend a lot of time kind of standing in the, in the sand or maybe even on oyster beds and fishing. If you're doing that, you don't want to cut your feet on those oyster beds. So having some good booties is important. I like the ones that come up ankle high and, and the ankle high I, I like because it's someplace I don't have to put sunscreen. You need a lot of sunscreen when you're fishing out um, on the flats. You know, you get beat down if you've done any kayak fishing. Uh, you'll only do it for one day if you don't wear sunscreen. And I, I try to do the 100 proof stuff. Uh, so moving on, next thing here. You can see here, this is the rail that came on the kayak, standard. I picked this tip up off of YouTube. Somebody was doing it. Um, but you take a tailor's tape measure and you can put it down in there. It'll fit perfectly. Try not to stretch it out. And if you forget your fish measure or you want a really quick way to measure a fish, this will give you an idea of what that fish uh, length is. Um, the other end of it is that uh, it's, it's the tape that's in there. It's not cloth. I got it from Walmart, I think. It's like a plastic coated cloth. So you take these screws out, put it down in there, drill some holes, put it down, and you'll never have to mess with it again. And you'll always have a, a tape measure with you um, in case you forget yours. My fishing rod mounts. I use Scotty mounts, you know. There's a whole lot of other mounts. It'd be really great. I think somebody asked me a question on one of my other uh, YouTube videos about how I have it mounted with two screws. That's it. I don't, you know, I don't have any screws in here. I have these two screws. That's all I've ever needed. Um, you know, that's how rails are made. I mounted it on this side because I figured the fish torque would be in this direction and not the other way. Um, plus it pushes it out and gets it out of the way. But I use these Scotty mounts, dropping them in here, bam. There I go. Um, talking about my fishing rod mount. So when you buy the regular Scotty, you've got this piece on this piece. And so your rod holder is about this big. The problem with that is 
that if you put any type of fishing rod in these things, and this is a fairly small rod, you got the butt of your rod hanging out. So when it's mounted down here, that butt is all in your knees and in the way, and I see a lot of people fishing that way. If you'll go out and buy this, is this the 10 or 12 inch extension? And get that rod on out there a little bit. Now all this space is free for pedaling, for tying lures on, for whatever. And it just gets that thing out where I can see it. If I want to move and troll, I can pedal my kayak or paddle and get this thing out of the way. It also gets a little higher off the salt. Gives you a little, uh, a little more flexibility in moving this rod around and setting it up how you want to. I only use one of those when I'm inshore. I only use one of these. Um, I do have two. Um, you know, I keep it about right there. Sometimes I just throw it on top of this crate back here. You can see I've put some pool noodle on there. Anything you don't want to lose kayak fishing, and I've lost one of these or two of these before, um, throw a pool noodle on it, and then when you drop it in the water, it'll float. All right, moving on. Um, talking about my tray here, another tip I got for Slayer owners, and I'm going to push this guy out of the way. Um, if you uh, have a Slayer and you have this dashboard, drill little holes. There's one hole here, one hole here, one hole here. You see that hole? And then a hole here and a hole here. That allows, like when the boat goes by and splashes some water in here, you don't have standing water sitting here. The water will go ahead and drain out. A lot of times this area will have a drink in it. It'll have fishing lures that I've taken off or put on, and I don't want them sitting there just being drenched in salt water. A fish rag, of course you need that. I use it in the meantime, like driving down the road to put under there so I don't have a lot of shot coming down on here. Uh, next thing, got this off of Amazon. It is a plastic holster. Um, it can be used to hold all kinds of things when I'm fishing. It has held these pliers before. It has held these fish grips before. It will hold a knife if you're cutting bait and throwing that on rigs and you know it kind of keeps it out of the way so you don't cut yourself but it's handy for all kinds of things i don't permanently store my pliers there but i do like having it because when i'm working tying a lure i just took a, a hook out of a fish's mouth or something i don't want to throw my uh, pliers down in the salt water because usually there's a little bit of standing water down in the, in the bottom of your kayak um, i can throw them in that holster and it will keep them up out of the salt water until I'm ready to return them to my little caddy over here. Uh, talking about scuppers. So you can see this kayak has one, two, three on each side. There are six scuppers in the cab of my kayak. When I'm fishing inshore, and this is inshore only, unless it's rough, I keep them uh, corked up like this. That keeps the salt water out. Uh, I use a sponge if something splashes in and gets a little bit in there. If I get a lot in there, I'll just pop one of the front foot corks and uh, let it drain out but it keeps things dry for me inshore now when I go in the ocean I absolutely take all of the scuppers out in the front I've got a scupper hole here I leave that thing open all the time I don't care if salt water gets in there it can have at it in the back I've got two scuppers under this crate I leave them open all the time so my rule at least for my kayak is inshore I cork up up here and for everything uh, I don't cork the front or the back and for offshore or, or fishing in the ocean um, I uncork everything all right so moving down here um, your Slayer comes standard with this uh, fishing rod holder that's right beside you uh, the the in hole mount it's really awesome what I use it for is when I catch a fish and I need to get that rod out of the way so I can start working on getting the hook out of the fish and put my rod in there I can also put it in there like if I'm tying lures on that rod would just sit in here like this. I don't really fish with it there. It is a staging location while I tie lures on or do what, whatever else I need to do. Throw that back in the tray. All right, so moving on here, you can see uh, I've got on my Slayer, I've got this little uh, nodule here. These are great for like mounting cameras. I've got a GPS that sometimes I can mount on there. Like if I'm going offshore and I want to go to a reef, and that reef's not marked. I can use a GPS, get the coordinates, and I got a little handheld that can sit right there. It's also neat because I can, it's just something to grab. Like sometimes when I stand up on my kayak, it's just something to grab onto to kind of keep some balance until I get up. Uh, so it's neat having that guy on there. 
All right, talking about my little caddy here. This is uh, this is some aftermarket stuff you can get from Native Watercraft. This is exactly what I carry. Fish grips. Yeah, they're absolutely necessary. Most uh, fish in salt water have teeth. Flounder have teeth. Uh, trout have teeth. So if you're trying to grab that fish's mouth to get a hook out or just to take a picture or whatever, these fish grips are great. They make them in the small and the large. I like the large because you, uh, you know, if you catch a better to be prepared for the big fish than not prepared. A pair of pliers. I think Berkeley makes these just a standard this is seven or eight inch pliers. Um, they're going to rust. Uh, these are steel. I like steel better than aluminum. So I just consistently spray them with WD-40 and then I clean the rust off and spray them again, spray them again. Got me a little uh, hook removal tool. Sometimes your flounder will swallow these, uh, swallow these lures or hooks and get them pretty deep in them. It might be a little small flounder, uh, smaller than you can legally keep. And so you can use that to de-hook them. I have some scissors here. They also rust all the time and I have to clean them up. But sometimes I, some of my rods have braid on them. And if you've ever tried to cut braid, you know, it, it can be difficult to do with like a, a regular pair of snips. So that's what they're for. I also use them to cut line because they're so convenient. My last caddy I used to put 100 uh, SPF sunscreen. And I never put anything but 100 in my kayak because I don't even know if you... You know, it may say 100, you're probably in reality getting about 80 protection, so I use 100 all the time. Um, another thing on my seat, you see I've got this uh, little gear keeper with uh, a pair of fingernail slips, snips. They're stainless steel, but you can see nothing lasts in the salt. Um, and that's what I use like when I'm clipping. So I got that rod mounted here, I'm tying lures on. I can put that guy up here, clip the line, let go of it. It's not going in the salt water. Believe it or not, the gear keeper holds this thing just high enough where it doesn't dangle in the bottom of my kayak and get in the salt water. Now, over time, it's going to get wet like everything else. And so that can cause, uh, cause them to rust like that. All right, moving back here. Here is a, I forget what this is called, a clam line keeper or whatever. Either way, uh, if you're working your... Uh, anchor trolley here and then you want to work it to the back and you want to that thing to be stationary at the back you can take this and do that right there and that line's not going to move you could also for a hasty anchor if i did have an, a true anchor in here you could use the line and fish it through there also my bait bucket i could fish the line through there to hold it but that comes uh, comes in pretty handy for all sorts of things uh, on the back of my seat here, you can see I've got a, a kind of El Cheapo knife. Um, why do I have this particular knife back here? I carry two knives on the kayak. There's one here on my tray and one back here. Uh, both of them are inexpensive knives, but I just carry two because sometimes there's a chance I could forget this one or I just need to cut bait really quick. And so I've got that second little knife right there. It rusts all the time. I just keep spraying it with WD-40 and uh, I keep a rough edge on it. So sometimes I use a file to sharpen it. Uh, most of the things I'm cutting are either line or cutting up bait fish. And that rough edge seems to work perfect. I've got this little shorty Atwood extending uh, paddle. I use this because, you know, on the, um, on the Slayer, you've got a, a pedal system. And sometimes I just want to move a little bit to the left or the right. And I don't want to make like a big drastic movement where I'm going to unhook and do all that. So I just use this as a hand paddle either to push in the water or let's say I drift over close to the grass. And now the grass is like sticking me in the side and stuff and I'm getting tired of that. I'll use this to push off the bank. It extends. I hardly ever use it in an extended way, but, but there you go. A fish measurer. Um, if you want people to know how big the fish you, you catch are, you'll need one of these. Like I said, I've got this tape measure here. But if I want to know exactly, I can use this. I also take a picture of the small fish I catch just to uh, kind of remember them by, I guess. I keep that guy right there. In, in mentioning this, so my crate tie downs, um, uh, you know, kayak fishermen everywhere use crates. I like to hook, I put these two pad eyes here to hook instead of hooking here. The reason I did that is when it's hooked here, the, this bungee is across here and you can't use this space here. This is great space, okay? Because when I got something long like this that won't fit anywhere else, that's a great place to keep it. And so by having these pad eyes and bungeeing this in right here, I kind of make use of some of this side space that I might not have otherwise. All right, moving on, my bait bucket. 
it's a standard fray bill uh was it slow and troll or whatever um this bait bucket i'll tell you this if you're going to use one of these get you a net bend it because it won't fit in there fully extended and throw it in there and you won't you'll lose half of the bait fish that you lose if you're trying to reach in there and grab minnows reach in there and grab shrimp uh, if you've ever tried that, there's no way you can start with 10 minnows and fish 10 minnows. If you're using your hand, then at least two or three of those will escape out of your hand while you're doing that. I clip it off on a line, and my troll bucket trolls exactly that length. That, the uh, length of this line is set that way for a reason. It prevents this line from going over this floating on top of the rudder and the line getting all tied up in the rudder. So I keep it that exact length so that when I'm paddling along, if I've got this thing out, it will ride right back here. Believe it or not, it won't hit the side of the kayak and I have to hear this constantly and it won't get tangled up in the rudder. The other thing is, if the line's a lot longer, then at some point, you know, the, the current will drift it around. So if it does start to drift around, at least it just taps that little rudder right there underwater, and it's not super loud. Another cool thing you can do with these on the Slayer, if you're stationary and you're fishing, this kayak, this model of kayak, has like two pontoon hulls and like a trough underneath. You can literally take this bait bucket, if you're stationary, you can push it under and it will then, the, the air in it will float up and it will sit in the trough underneath your kayak. Why would you do that? Because you're trying to keep your bait alive. You got, you know, 20 finger mullet in here. They don't like being up here on the surface where it's all hot and the sun's beating down on. So you push it down there, drop the uh, temperature a little bit, and they still get the uh, water flowing through there. That'll keep them alive a lot longer. So just a little nifty trick there. What else is in my crate here? All right, got spare carabiners here because you could use them for all kinds of things uh gatorade bottle what's that for it's to pee in so um you know it just makes it easier to pee uh, and dump the pee in the water i don't have to talk about that anymore i got a place to put my phone i painted the inside of this white you can see i do that because the sun beats down on it and it gets like crazy hot in there so when, when i painted it white on the inside it doesn't happen uh, it doesn't get as hot and ruin my phone. Uh, WD-40, you use it for all kinds of things. I spray my reels down to keep the salt uh, so that when this, I'm not spraying reels with WD-40 as a lubricant. I spray the WD-40 and then wipe it off so that when the salt water splashes up here, the pores in the metal on here are filled with an oil. That oil helps the salt water drip right off along with the salt. And when I get back, I don't have like salt spotted on there and dried on there. Um, I'm not using it to lube the inside. I spray the outside of the reels. But that's why most people spray their reels with WD-40. It's not, it's not necessarily about lubricating the uh, gears and stuff like that. There's marine grease inside the reel that handles that. All right. I got a light in the uh, state of North Carolina. You have to have a light on your kayak. You, almost, you also have to have a PFD. Uh, which I didn't put on the kayak to demonstrate, but yeah, normally I would have a PFD. They'd probably just lay right here or be tucked under my seat. I don't, I don't wear one when I'm inshore. It's so shallow, uh, and I'm a pretty good swimmer that, I, that I've never had an issue with that. <coughs> uh, more sunscreen. This is 70. Um, my cast net, I'll throw it in right here. And then one of the primary things I fish with, gulp shrimp or... Gulp swimming mullet. These are these are my favorites right here. You got the white shrimp, the uh, I think that's called new penny or something. I don't know, but it's kind of the same color as a natural shrimp. And then the swimming mullets in chartreuse. Those are my three favorite gulps. I like the four inch shrimp. The reason I like four inch is it because the three inch won't catch fish. It's because the four inch is a thicker, hardier uh, plastic bait, and the pinfish seem to have a tougher time. Uh, biting the tails off of them because if you've ever fished with these baits are notorious for getting the tails bit off If they bite the tails off, you'll see I've got pieces of gulp shrimp in there Don't throw it away. You know why because you can put a drop rig on and use that as bait like cut bait Fish will hit this stuff. They love the way it smells. So if you don't have um, If you're if you're putting like a, a double drop rig like this guy right here in you can put a little hook on there and just put a piece of gulp on there and catch little uh, croakers or something like that with. So, 
I keep those gulps in there. Uh, already talked about my flashlight. Uh, talked about my cast net. I will say this, my cast net is, it's like the smallest you can get. I think it's maybe, uh, maybe a four foot radius. I don't know. It's one of the smaller cast nets. I think the size on it is quarter inch or maybe three eighths of an inch. That's perfect for catching finger mullet and shrimp and that's typically what I catch in it. I use a smaller net because I actually cast it off of my kayak sometimes. So if you've got like a six foot diameter net and you're trying to stand on this thing and cast it, you're gonna get tangled in everything. Um, the little small net is perfect. Um, usually, uh, you know, I, I'm not getting enough bait to fish for four days. So it, it works for the kayak. All right, moving on back. Actually, let me move back up here really quick because I think I left this out. A buddy of mine bought a Slayer and it had a uh, Walmart dry box like this mounted on there. I thought it was a great idea. And so I mounted one on mine. I just put some uh, screws down through there. What do I keep in here? I keep the uh, saltwater limits uh, and krill limits and links. That one's a 2017 model or 2017 version. And you can see I laminated it so the salt won't eat it up. I keep a copy of my fishing license in here some sunglasses holders, a little drink holder, and sometimes I throw my sunglasses in here. Most of the time I'm wearing the sunglasses, but it's just a good place to store a few small things away. If you didn't have a cell phone uh, package like I have back here to keep your cell phone in, you can put your cell phone in there. All right, moving on back on the kayak. I'm talking about my, uh, my actual crate here. You can see this is nothing but a, you know, just El Cheapo crate you can get anywhere. On the bottom, I put like half inch camping, uh, closed cell phone, or is that open cell phone? Whatever, it's like the foam padding you would buy in the camping section, those blue rolls, same stuff as this. I put it underneath there, it keeps things quiet, keeps it from bouncing around, and it just helps conform, you know, the bottom of the kayak has these little ridges and stuff. It just helps the bottom of this thing conform to those ridges over time, and it makes it a little more stable than if it was just sitting up on top of there with the hard plastic. I also put some, uh, this is like patio, waterproof, weatherproof carpet, that, and it's just sitting in there. I put that in there so that when I chunk stuff back in here, it just, you can see it's pretty quiet, you know? When things are rattling around, when the boat is rocking because the waves are hitting it, this thing stays a little quieter than it probably would uh, without the foam and the carpet in there. Um, I, I have these. These I actually cut out of PVC. I used a Dremel or an angle grinder or something to cut these out, these notches. What they do is just, when you put a rod in there, it's gonna stay in the position that you set it. Some of the rods are a little too long for that. The base of them prevents that from going in. You could make the tube longer if you wanted to uh, really put a stop to uh, those spinning. Not a big deal, but just, uh, just a little nifty trick you can do. Back here, I've got this little pouch. I keep extra line in. I always keep these in the kayak. You can see I've got some 25 yard fluorocarbon and I've got some Trilene Extra Tough Low Viz Green 14 pound mono. Um, that's just some extra line. So if I'm tying rigs on the kayak, you know, I want to put a shrimp on the end of a popper cork. I've got to I obviously add this piece of line so I can pull it off of there in whatever size I want. Um, all right. I'll come back to the rods in a second. Talking about back here, this is where, this is the cooler I keep my lunch in. I've got this one and another one of those little Playmates where the lid folds back and forth. Put my lunch in there so it doesn't mix with the fish. My uh, net, if you don't have a net, okay, go buy one. The day you need a net when you're fishing and you don't have one will be the most miserable day uh, of your life because you will finally catch that big fish, that keeper that you've been uh, shooting for, and you won't have a way to, to get your fish out of the water and into the boat. So do not go fishing without a net. You can see, I like, this is a, I think this is a Freebill brand. Um, yeah, Freebill. But I like this version because when I'm fishing, it, I've got the, the fish is on in one hand. I can take this and put it in my left hand and use my foot to set the net and then get down in the water catch my fish use my foot to kind of work the the leverage if it's a heavy fish but when i want to put it away as you can see it will fold up into itself 
so that when it's on the kayak and the wind is blowing across the water, this thing isn't catching quite as much wind. Also, when I'm casting and I've got lures back here, you know, maybe this isn't getting tangled in with those lures. Um, you see my sponge here. Another thing, you don't go out on the water without a sponge. A sponge is great just for cleaning up fish blood or sand that gets in here. You know, you're going to get out and be throwing your cast net to catch bait fish to put in your bait bucket. You're going to get back in. There's going to be sand and black mud all in the inside of your kayak. The sponge is great for getting that out. Um, or if you have a water back here that you want to get out, the sponge is great for that. Um, here's my general camera mount, okay? And, and I'll go ahead and talk about these as well. I added both of these flush mount in hull uh, kayak um, rod holders. These are great um, and, and they're great coupled with this. They're not great by themselves because if you leave a fishing rod in there long term, this low to the water, the water splashes up and if you don't have the rod lifted out, then your reel is going to be down here getting salt water splashed on it all day long. So the extension simply gets the reel high enough so that when waves hit the side of the boat and they're splashing water up in here, they're not getting on my reel and ruining my reel. So a little nifty trick. You can see I spray painted mine uh, lime green here for aesthetics. This one almost always has my camera on it. I like it on the left side because I'm right-handed. So when I'm casting, if I had it on the, the right side there, it'd be getting all in the way of my casting. So I usually leave that one empty unless I'm fishing a rig that's just dropped in the water. Maybe I'm just drifting and there's a flounder rig drifting with me and I want a rod holder. I'll put that one there. I may take this second rod holder and then mount it over here and put the second rod here. So I'm drifting and I've got two flounder rigs, Carolina rigs out, just dragging along behind me uh, on one of these rods. So that's where I put my camera. If you're going to use a GoPro, you may want sound and there's ways to get it. My particular cameras. I keep these closed. I just don't get sound anymore because the salt water will eat them up. The other cool thing. Okay, so talking about my camera mount. Uh, actually, let me get back on these. Another thing about these is you can, when you try to put a regular size PVC, it wouldn't fit in there, okay? So what you can do to get this flare on in, I think Zoffinger is the one that shows how to do this. You use a heat gun on this one and a quarter inch PVC, and I bought the thin stuff here. You can use a heat gun and a Coke bottle, and you take this thing, and like, if this is the Coke bottle over here, you see I got some spray paint. You push this, when you, before you cut the groove, you push this down on the, on the end of a bottle or something like that while it's hot, and you can flare the ends of that thing so that your rod kind of slides in there more easily. Then take a Dremel tool and cut out this little U-shaped place where your rod can ride. Um, I cut that slit in there and you see I put a little drill to hole at the end so they wouldn't crack any further so that it would slide down in there with a narrow end and then get up to the thick end so that it holds in there. When I have my rods in there and I'm just trolling, that's what my rod looks like. And you can see the reel is just high enough to be up off of the water. I use that for inshore and offshore. But I almost never take these things out. They, they are a great easy rod holder. If you wanted to like put the kayak up on a truck or something like that and just give it a low profile so it's not getting tangled, they're easy to pull out. Also comes with these uh, two little pad eyes that are neat for uh, hooking things up. Uh, you might wonder what this is. Um, later I'll do an offshore video where I talk about my offshore. What I use this for is to clip my um, gaff in. Uh, you could also clip something, you know, I don't know, you clip this thing in. But it's a little setup where you can just strap long things down. Uh, back to my camera mount. This is a simple painter's pole with this Ram flex rod. I don't know what this system is, but Ram has all kinds of stuff. You can buy this particular system to hold your GoPro camera. Obviously, I can turn this. It's not loose right now and then slide this thing out and I can get some really tall long views from my kayak. You know, you can take this thing and then put it in your regular Scotty rod holder and get some views from the front if you want it but just a, a neat camera system. Um, down here on the end, obviously the pole was too narrow to sit in here tight. So I used some duct tape and some foam, probably the blue foam, I can't remember what kind, or pipe uh, insulation, put it on there and duct taped it so that it would have a tight fitting in there. And that way, like my camera is not just like flopping over to the side and stuff like that. It gives it just enough tension where that camera will sit uh, steady.
All right, uh, back over on this side of the kayak. So this is how I lock my paddle in. I've got a two-point system. The reason being is because if you just have it like on this kayak beside me, this is my son's kayak, if you've just got that type of uh, clip that holds your paddle, a wave will inevitably hit your paddle and knock it off and you won't be paying attention. And then you'll be looking for a paddle with no way to move around in the kayak. Obviously, I could use my propel in here. But I hook it in in two ways. First, and I got this off somebody on YouTube, I've got this uh, bungee that I just use zip ties to secure this to. And I put this kind of low profile um, little hook here that I can hook it in. Why low profile? Because you're getting in and out of the kayak sometimes in three and four feet of water. And so I'm sliding my butt up over this. Or sometimes if I'm fishing in the ocean, you know, maybe I'm sliding back off of it because I'm bringing the kayak in and I'm in the breakers. You can see right there where I bent my rail one time because I had another type of hook up here and my shorts got hung as I came off and put so much torque on that it had bent that rail. So I got this little low profile thing so that if my shorts or you know my rear end as I'm coming across there, nothing hooks up and causes, causes that thing to bend. And so it's kind of out of the way. Uh, another rod, uh, Scotty rod holder over here, same as, same as the other side. Up here on the front, you'll see I've got this big old knob. It's a dual purpose thing, you know. Uh, whenever you're rigging a kayak up, have dual purpose for everything. A, it holds the front end of my paddle. Keeps that thing locked in there. So even if a wave hits this, this thing's not coming off. It's not going to flex and get down in the water. The other thing it does, not for inshore, but for offshore. Uh, if you're taking your kayak out through the breakers and you're standing in the water counting waves and waiting for that perfect wave so that you can make it out, it gives you a second place to put your left hand on so so I can grip this with my left hand and then grip this chair with my right hand and stand beside the kayak while I watch the waves and wait for that perfect moment to jump up on here and take this paddle and start heading out into the water so it's a handle it's also a, a, it secures the um, the paddle another thing if you uh, like to film some of your fishing like I do it gives a mounting point for like a dog bone type uh, GoPro mount like this so uh, I don't have it on there right now, but uh, just a, a cool feature. I think that about does it, man. I've almost covered everything. Now let's talk about uh, rods and let's talk about my actual tackle that I carry with me. All right. So coming back here, I'm a fan. I've fished uh, for years now. I'm a fan of no more than three rods. You can see that this thing is pretty cluttered, even with three rods. Four rods for me is too much. So, inshore, I go with three rods, and this is my thinking behind each rod. I've got a bigger rod here. I say bigger, it's not that much bigger. This is a 4000 series. Uh, this is a sweep, I think it's a Shakespeare sweep fire. I've had this reel forever, no, Daiwa sweep fire. Um, this rod, I have a flounder rig on. And you can see, uh, that's what I'm going to use to fish... Um, finger mullet that I catch on the water. Uh, a cool thing I like to do when I'm putting my flounder rig on and I'm floating around out there is I take the hook on the end here and I'll unhook it. And there's my Carolina rig. And I like to wrap around the back of this rod and then come back. What that does is, geez, I need to set this thing down so you can see it. If I take this and I decide just to hook it up and hook the hook up here. I got this weight up here. And as I'm paddling around, this is what I'm hearing all day long if I'm not fishing this rod. So by taking this down here, wrapping it around the back end of the reel, and then coming back up to hook this, I keep this weight low down here and I don't have to listen to that all day. The, the Carolina rig is pretty much standard for me for catching flounder and drum. Okay, that's my main go-to. I put finger mullet on it. I'll throw a shrimp on there. I'll throw a small pinfish on there. I'll throw cut bait on there. Um, just a really popular rig. This hook that I have on here, the, the weight is a one ounce egg weight with two beads. If you don't know it, the beads on um, a Carolina rig are not necessarily for the fish to see. A lot of people think they are. What it's for is to keep the sand from abrading that line as that weight bounces against that swivel. If I didn't have that, then that metal would be bouncing against that knot all day long, and eventually it would fray and break the line. And eventually it will do that too, but the uh, beads help prevent some of that fraying. So that's why that's on there. My hook here, you can see, 
is a three-aught uh, circle octopus hook. Um, I've got some right here. Uh, those are the two brands that I like, Gamagatsu and Eagle Claw Laser Shop. They're laser Sharp, both of them are circle octopus. The circle hook talks about this part right here. A circle hook will be like that. It will be in line. It will not have an angle. And then the octopus is this part right here. Um, the eye of the hook is angled back a lot like that. I like it because when I've got a bait fish on there, you can see that that kind of just lays perfectly in line with his head. What a circle hook's for is so that if that flounder swallows this thing, when you pull it, it comes out of his mouth because as you can see, it won't hook his gullet. As it gets comes out of his mouth and it gets to the corner of the fish's mouth, the drum or the flounder or whatever, that's when it bites. And so that's why guys use circle hooks. It's to help save the fish. Uh, the, you know, sometimes they swallow your bait before you get a chance. That circle hook helps to pull that hook out of the fish's gullet. And if it's a throwback, let's say it's a 13 inch flounder um, and you're going to put him back in the water to catch next year, then you'll hook his lip, but you won't hook his esophagus uh, or his, I guess, esophagus or stomach or whatever down inside him. So that's one rod. One of my rods has some, uh, this is an ugly stick. It, it is just a, uh, um, uh, no, not fiberglass. What is this thing made out of? I can't remember. Ugly sticks are notorious for not breaking. So it's not a, yeah, a fiberglass rod, not a graphite rod. Because sometimes I'm not paying attention. I'll throw my uh, finger mullet on here and just drag it while I'm drifting across the water. And maybe I'm fishing one of the other rods. If this line gets hung up, the rod will bend and not break. I like to use mono on this particular rod. I think this one right now has maybe uh, 15 pounds uh, mono on it. I like the mono because it is abrasive resistant. It lasts longer than braid. Uh, it has the flexibility. So if I get hung up and I'm not paying attention, I don't break my line. I can just find no reason why on a Carolina rig you would use anything but mono. It's the cheapest. Uh, and so that's what I use on this particular rod that basically is used for nothing except you running a Carolina rig or running a common drop rig like, look at that, I've hooked myself, like this guy right here, like a surf fishing rig, a drop rig. That's what I fish off that particular rod. My next rod, it does have braid on it, okay? And this is a smaller rod. I think this has like 10 pound braid on it um, with a either fluorocarbon or a mono leader to give it just a little bit of abrasive resistance where the jig is. That is uh, a blue water candy jig head that I painted. I like gold and I like speckles and you can buy some of them in some of those colors. But if you want to make your own, go to your daughter's or your wife's fingernail polish and take their fingernail polish. Or when you go to the dollar store, pick you up some gold speckled or silver speckled fingernail polish. You can paint your lure heads. I like that color. It's almost like a shrimp color. You can paint your lure heads to look like this, okay? So you can buy the standard, just grayed out uh, lead ones, and then you can paint them and put some uh, reflection on them. This blue water candy, I love this, this rig right here, and this is usually what I buy. I like it because it has this big wide hook, which is great for hooking up uh, on a, on a flounder with his big old wide mouth or a drum. Um, some of the hooks you'll find on these jig heads will be smaller ones. You know, they'll come around and maybe only be this wide. I don't like that. I like that big wide hook. I think I get better hookups with it. What am I putting on there? The same thing I talked about before. I'm putting my chartreuse swimming mullet in the four inch or my favorite, the white gulp shrimp in four inch or the new penny. Put that thing on there and that's my jig and rod. That's why I have braid on it. Um, I won't talk a whole bunch about the difference between braid and mono. I'll say this, if you're a newbie and you've never fished braid, just keep stick to your mono. It's not that big a deal. And braid can be a pain because you have to tie uh, a special knot to connect your mono to your braid. And trying to do that on a kayak sometimes, if that line breaks, can be a mess because you're jostling around in the water trying to tie knots and all that. But this is my jigging rod, so I use this to fish that shrimp. I like the braid because it doesn't flex and I can, I can feel this jig hitting the bottom of the sand. When you're fishing this type of lure, you're probably gonna be fishing right on the bottom and this thing's gonna hit sand over and over. That's why I like the eye of this thing. As you see, it's stuck up in the air a little bit as this is going through the water and it's hitting the bottom. It's hitting like this right here and it's not affecting my knot and hopefully uh, not abrading the knot so that I lose my 
expensive gulp shrimp lure. My third rod, so I have a, a heavier fiberglass rod for dragging this weight behind me with some heavier mono. This might be 15, might be 20 pounds. And then I've got my jigging rod, which has 10 or eight pounds. It's a little bit lighter because it's not just gonna be dragging on the bottom with me not paying attention like that uh, flounder rig is. My third rod is just somewhere in between these two, okay? This is a dual purpose rod, so I keep mono on it. That way, if I wanna run two flounder rigs, I can throw a flounder rig on here. But if I wanna throw a topwater rig on here because the trout are hitting, right? So my sea trout are hitting, then I can put this popping shrimp cork on here. Um, I forget what types of shrimp these are, but I like it for uh, these uh, shrimp corks because the tail is so flexible that it just has a natural look to it. You could also put a hook on here and put a live shrimp on it and use that. And, and like I said, if I wanted to, let's say I drop this rod in the water and lose it or something, I can, this rod can now double as my jigging rod. Or if I wanna run two flounder rigs, this rod can double as another Carolina rig in the water. So that's my three rod system. I like my jigging rod to have braid. I like my other two to have mono. Um, and that's my thought process behind having them like that. Okay, so let's talk about tackle a little bit. Let me get this guy out of the way. You can see I carry two trays. I keep them in this little caddy underneath the seat. One of them is inshore terminal tackle, the other inshore uh, crankbakes and jigs. And I label them so I can pull them out like that and know exactly which one uh, I've pulled out. I'll take them up here. The first thing I'll talk about is the fact uh, or at least the type of trays that I use. Um, and you can see I use these watertight. I don't know who makes these. Uh, these are Plano, but I think some of the other companies make them as well. They're a little more expensive than a standard tackle tray, but I'll tell you what, you'll get your money's worth in the long run because if you keep the salt water out of here, then all of your lures don't rust. You know, some of these lures are fairly expensive. You know, a, little, a lure like that can cost you 10 bucks. So if you can keep your hooks and stuff in good working order and not have to replace them, uh, then you're gonna get your money's worth. I think these things are like 10 or 12 bucks a piece for the trays. So I carry two, two trays. One of them, like I said, has terminal tackle. One of them has like crankbaits, this soft bait, and jig heads. The same jig heads that I'm putting in my uh, gulp baits. Um, I'll start here with my uh, jig heads. You can see I've got like this little swimming mullet or menhaden jig uh, that's brand new. I keep a bucktail in here. Um, it's pretty popular to fish a, just like a, I would fish a gulp bait shrimp. That's not a gulp, but you'd put the shrimp on a hook on one of these jig heads like that. It's popular to fish them on a uh, bucktail as well. So I've got a bucktail in here. I've got some uh, like casting spoon type lures. I uh, might use these if trout are hitting uh, bait on the top of the water or I see like a, a school of bait and can tell that something is tearing them up on the top of the water. You can cast these things. I think these are called stingers or something. Cast them a really long ways um, and fish the top of the water. Um, and that's why having that third rod that kind of maybe doesn't have a rig on it, the one that I've got the popper cord on now is good. Because you can throw something like that on there and just be ready to go if you're seeing uh, constantly while you're fishing, you're seeing like fish hit the top of the water and you throw something out there. This is a little standard, uh, I don't know what it's called, but like really popular for fishing for drum. I think I've only caught like one drum on the, this. I, I don't really fish it that often, but it is in here. I've got a uh, Hedden Zara, what is this, Zara Spook, or this one is a Super Spook. Um, a little crab deal. I've never fished that, but I always thought maybe when I'm uh, paddling up next to these pylons and stuff out in the intercoastal, sometimes you see sheephead down there, you know, if it's, if it's deeper down on the channel or stuff. I always thought about dropping that down and catching one of them. Never, <laughs> I've never indulged that yet, but I, that's why it's in there. Um, and then all my jig heads that I use for my Berkeley uh, gulp shrimp. Um, I think I said before, these are my favorite. They're the, uh, the blue water candy. This is a quarter ounce this size hook. Like I said before, some of the other manufacturers that make uh, that make these jig heads, it's like their hook size isn't quite as big as the uh, Blue Water Candy. And that's why I like them. I like that really big hook like that. So here's some other ones that I bought um, in a chartreuse color. 
Um, you can see these I painted myself. That's the one that's kind of in the fingernail polish. It's kind of like the shrimp color. Here's a natural, uh, just lead colored one that I bought that I haven't quite painted yet. These are 1 8 ounce. So if the water was like super, super calm and I wanted to fish this, that lighter jig head weight in really, really calm water kind of lets the, uh, the plastic bait, uh, it, you know, have more action, whereas this might not. It, obviously, if the water is moving and I need a heavier one, then I've got this. I think this is a uh, half ounce jig head here. So I've got some of these heavier jig heads to get that thing down and, and help uh, keep the current from carrying it off. So those are my jig heads that I use on my swim baits, my swim mullets, and my uh, uh, four inch gulp shrimp. Um, then, gosh, I got to remember the names of these. You see them in, but, but in the store, but they're really popular. I like them. I like to fish them on that um, popping cork uh, if, if I'm not fishing a real shrimp. I do carry this chapstick stuff, which is, you smear it on there. This one's made, what is it called? Saltwater shrimp? Fish. This is the Fish Sticks Original Lure Enhancer. So it is a just a scent attractant that you can smear on there. You can smear it on a hard bait if you wanted to. Maybe get a few extra hits that you wouldn't normally get off of that. Uh, and then I've just got some standard split shot if I want to get a, a lure down a little deeper or something like that. I've got some uh, snap swivels. If I'm switching between lures a lot, um, and, uh, and so like that third rod, I could put a snap swivel on there. I could have this stinger on there, and then let's say I want to switch to a shrimp and throw it on there real quick. I could do that. So that's why the snap swivels are in here. Here's my terminal tackle. And, you know, essentially everything in here is kind of set up for like a Carolina rig setup. I use those so often. Um, I pre tie, so I have my hooks here. My favorite hooks are the uh, Gamagatsu Octopus Circle and the Laser Sharp Octopus Circle. My favorite sizes are the 3 alt, and you can see this is the 3, and this is the 3, and then the number 1. The number 2 is, is just a uh, minute size larger than this, uh, so I like 3 and 1, and that's what I use in the inshore. Offshore, I might use like a, a bigger lure but, or bigger hook, but uh, this is what I'm using inshore. Um, I think I talked about it earlier, but I like, you know, the circle hooks keep you from getting, uh, hooking the inside gullet of the, of the fish. Um, the, the reason being, as I slide this along here, it doesn't hook up, right? Only when it goes around a corner does it finally grab. And that's why uh, fishermen will use these. That one's a little bent. Um, but the, if they're not offset and stuff like that, they're designed so that the fish can swallow them and still pull it out of their throat without hooking the fish. It doesn't hook up until it actually is coming around the corner of their mouth and then catches them. They say a lot of times the circle hooks will hook the fish themselves. I've got some swivels on in here. Um, most of my rigs though are pre-tied. So these Carolina rigs I'm fishing, uh, you can see here I've pre-tied a three alt hook and then I've probably got two feet of line there and uh, my line will be like, I don't know, 15 pounds maybe and or 12 pounds something like that and then I've got my swivel and then I just tie that off after I put my bead my weight and another bead on um, I've got different size weights actually I should have a one and a half ounce in here but these are all ones that's the most popular I use on my Carolina rig is that one ounce weight uh, usually I have a bigger one and a half in case the waters uh, there's a little more current more snap swivels these things are neat, and this is why, because you can slide this yellow part over the line, and then you've got this clip space. You can clip a weight on there. What that gives you is a, is a Carolina rig that you can take the weight off of, okay? It's not as low profile as the Tide Carolina rig with the egg weight on there. You would be dropping it like this. But if the current's really hard and I want to put a heavy weight on there, you know, sometimes I don't know how heavy I need. So I might need uh, three ounces, which is what this is. And I might need two ounces, which is what this is. And who knows, maybe that current's really, really hard and I want a diamond pyramid weight that'll actually grab into the sand a little bit and hold my rig down there. Uh, looking up here, I've got a float if I want to float something on the top. And then here, I, these are just standard drop rigs, just standard old surf rigs like I talked about over here, you know, where you've got, you tie your line off and then you've got a weight down here at the bottom and then hook and hook. You see these things everywhere. So sometimes I fish those on my, um, on my, I guess my Carolina rig rod. Uh, that first rod I showed you, the bigger rod. And so just to keep them from getting tangled up in everything, because like they have, just like it's getting tangled up there, I keep them inside this bag and then I can cram them down in the bottom of this thing. They don't get any salt water on them, they stay good. And I can put my hooks on top of there and my pre-tied rigs, which usually, you know, I'd have 
two, at least two of each size of these pre-tied ready to go. Um, I took uh, one of them off and put it on the rod just for demonstration earlier, but I'd have them inside those pill bags. And that's it, man. That's all the tackle that I carry out onto the sound. Um, you don't need a lot of stuff. If, if you're not using it and you're on a kayak, it's just in the way. My popping cork here, it's too long. I know they make some smaller ones, but I like this kind. What is it, the DOA? I think it's called like Cajun Thunder or something. Or maybe that's a different brand, but, but it's similar to this. I like the ones that are this size, so I don't keep it in my tackle box. I just throw it down in the bottom of my tray when I'm not using it. It, it wouldn't fit in here. But that's it. That's, that's the tackle that I use. Um, I'll throw this guy back in here. Uh, two tackle trays. That's all. Um, they, st they stay up under on my seat there so that they're not laid down in the salt water. I think that that Native Watercraft uh, little holster caddy thing that they sell is a really neat idea to kind of keep some of your stuff out of the salt water. Um, and that's my rig. That's my setup. Uh, I hope uh, that you've learned something from this video. Maybe you've picked up a tip that you can use. Um, like I said, all of these tips weren't my idea. I got them from watching other people. I just thought it'd be a neat idea to put together all my, my whole rig and just talk about it. And maybe somebody who's new to kayak fishing or somebody who's old to kayak fishing uh, can pick up something new that will help them uh, have as much fun as I've had out on the water. Anyway, thanks guys and we'll see you next time.